Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Event Right TV show. Or how I would normally do it on the TV show, I say, hello, welcome everyone to another Event Right show. How's that? Is that better? Um, anyway, so I'm really excited about this, guys. We're going to do our first live YouTube stream. We're going to do Q&A. If it has to do with inventing or licensing, please type it in, and I want to answer your questions. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I noticed some people already typed in some questions even before we got started here. So let me take a look at those. So I'm all about I'm all about great info, guys. So uh, we're just going to jump right in. Jump right in. So Luke, Luke Snyder, how would you structure an invention that would ultimately be sold to the government? Do you need to file a PPA? Do you need a business plan? So um, if you're selling a product to the government, you know, you always want to figure out who your ultimate potential licensee is. And a lot of products that the government would buy would not be um, manufactured by the government. So they're not your licensee. Let's break this out really simply first on how it would work for a consumer product, Luke. And then I'm going to explain how it would work for a government product. So you don't license to Walmart, right? If you have a shovel or a kitchen gadget or something like that, you license to the manufacturer, the brand that's selling at Walmart. And they are, you see, they already have five, six, seven, eight products in Walmart. So if you license it to, let's say, OXO, OXO Good Grips, right? They sell kitchen gadgets. And if you license to them, then you see they already have a lot of products in Walmart, Bed Bath & Beyond, Target, and elsewhere. Well, then you're going to get those products in the store. So let's go back to Luke's question about how do I license something to the military? So who is the manufacturer selling those products to the military that the military would then would then use? You said you didn't. Sorry, Luke, you didn't say military. You said government. OK, same thing. Um, so there are government contractors that make napkins or um, grenades or God knows everything under the sun contractors sell to the government. Right. And so you want to identify those government contractors. And so, again, the way you license your kitchen gadget is you first look at where is my product going to end up? If it's a kitchen gadgets and Walmart and Bed Bath and & Beyond and Target and Walgreens and Rite Aid, you look there for your potential licensees, the companies, because what do you know? You know that they have other products in that store already, so they have a relationship with that store, which is not easy. You have to be pretty big to be there. And they have um, the ability to make products. They have other products in that area. You know, you look at a company's product line, you're like, oh, they're in that area. So it's the same thing for the government. You know, you'd look at where the government buys their stuff, the equivalent of a Walmart, or what are those markets, what are those websites, and you look at the, the vendors that are there. You look at all the products that the government's buying. And my guess is that, you know, a lot of that is public information. So um, it's a little, it's a little bit, it's very specific, but I, I managed to answer everybody else's question too, is how do I figure out what companies to contact? Um, another question is from, I'm looking at my other monitor here, guys. So I'll move it over here. So I'm looking at you. Um, does anyone know if you, if you go license something you should have? You, oh, sorry. I'm going to do Audrey's question first. Um, Audrey Thomas. Is it safer to get a PPA before licensing the companies? How do you decide what company to pick to license your idea? So I just answered that one, Audrey. You, you make your list of retailers where you want to end up, and you look at the companies making products somewhat in the same area in those retailers. Now, the mistake, one thing that I'll, I'll say that's very interesting is our European students do a, a slightly better job than our American students with making their list of companies. So Americans, let's say you're working on a sporting good product and you look at the sporting good retailers. What most Americans will do is go, well, you know, near me there's a Dick's and a Big Five and there's these certain retailers and that's the only retailers they look at. But our European students that are licensing, they don't make that assumption because they don't know. So they go online. Now, in this case, I was on with a student once and they were on the East Coast and I was on the West Coast and they rattle off a name of a few retailers and I rattle off a name of a, a, a few retailers. And we're like, well, I don't know some of those. You don't know some of those. So and it's not always this easy. Most of the time it isn't. But 
I typed in list of major U.S. sporting good retailers. And there was this giant Wikipedia article with every major U.S. sporting good retailer. And there was a whole bunch neither of us knew. So getting back to the European students, European students don't assume who the retailers are in the U.S. They look them up. So my point is, look up who the major retailers are. Now, again, you're not licensing to the retailers. You're licensing to the manufacturers, the brands that are in the retailers. So if it's a kitchen gadget, OXO is a big company that has a lot of kitchen gadgets. There's other companies that make kitchen gadgets. And so that's how you make your list. So your question was, how do you decide what company to pick to license your idea? And you know, another thing that I'll say that we're always saying to our students and saying on our show too, if you can have 20 to 30 companies, it's 20 to 30 chances for success. If you have three companies, it's three chances for success. And the average inventor, Audrey, will always make a very anemic list of three or four companies, not the 20 or 30. Now, some projects only have 10, some only have 12. But if you have 20 or 30, you're going to reach out to all of them. So you need to do that. So let me get back here. Your other question, Audrey, was, is it safer to get a PPA before licensing companies? Absolutely. And you can file a provisional patent application in the U.S., for $70. Why wouldn't you? So I'd always, always file a provisional patent application. Um, let's see what else we got here. Any motivate? This is from Mary Ellen uh, Pennington. Any motivational tips for making the first contact? Um, Realize that when you're making a contact with a company, whether it's on LinkedIn or whether it's via email or whether it's via the phone, the only the one thing you're trying to do is not to sell. There you go. I said it just to get your attention. Not to sell. So your sell sheet for I realize some of you are fans, but some of you may not know what a sell sheet is. Is an eight and a half by eleven PDF that you email the company. It's an advertisement for your product. And guess what? It's not, we're going to make a million dollars. This is a great idea. It's none of that. It's an advertisement for their customer. So if they're selling kitchen gadgets, this kitchen gadget would be for their customer, not for them. So they look out and go, oh yeah, if the company, if, if the consumer saw this, I think they would want to buy it based on my knowledge of, you know, the marketing manager being in the business for 20 years. So it's, it's always um, good to realize that you're not selling. So getting to my point, what you're selling is the benefit of your product, but your sell sheet or your short 30 to second, 60 second video, that's doing the selling for you. You shouldn't try to ever sell on the phone. It's like trying to explain how to tie your shoelaces on the phone. Don't even try. So you, you said... Um, you said, any motivational tips for making the first contact? I love that question because the most motivational thing I can say to most inventors is you don't need to be a salesperson. Your sell sheet or your video is going to do the selling. You're just asking permission to send it. Doesn't matter if it's on LinkedIn. Doesn't matter if it's calling them on the phone and asking permission to sell it, to, to send it. But you're asking permission to email your sell sheet or your video. So that encourages people tremendously. A lot of people, the last thing they want to do is call a company. And they definitely don't feel like they can sell. But if you take your time, put together a good sell sheet, put together a good video, that can do the selling for you and you don't have to be nervous about it. So you asked for something that was motivational. That's one of the biggest motivational things I think we can say is with regards to reaching out to companies. Um, let's see. Princeton says, how would I go about structuring a PPA for a smartwatch if I'm unaware of the mechanical contents of the product? Um, well, I mean, and I don't know what your product is, Pennington, but a smartwatch, if, you know, you said, how would I be able to go about structuring the PPA for a smartwatch? My question is, are you inventing an accessory for a smartwatch? Like I have an Apple watch. I have, I don't have it on my wrist. I have it right here on my table. Um, is it an accessory or is it the smartwatch itself? Because one of the core fundamental principles of licensing is that if you have one company or two companies, Samsung and Apple, I know there's more, and they're your only potential licensees, I don't see that as very attractive. Now, if it's an accessory, if it's, I got my Apple Watch right here. If it's an accessory, some sort of cover 
or um, I can't lift it up because it's connected. I have an interesting little charger. Ben, call out to you. Thanks for the the the, the Apple Watch charger. Um, some unique charger or something. You know, think about that. How many people make chargers for smartwatches? Tons. I bought a few unique ones. Ben gave me one who does our smart pitch program. Now you probably have 20 or 30 potential licensees. So we can't get deep into it, Ben, because we can't have all the time to talk about your, your specific product. We can't make that public disclosure. But um, a smartwatch would be a much less attractive project to work on as opposed to a smartwatch accessory because you've only got a few really big mega companies. Now, there's my seven-year-old has a smartwatch. It's like a cheapy, light, like fun thing. So, you know, you always want to look at who is your list of potential licensees? Is it two? And are they mega corporations that are going to be possible to get to? Or is it like a smart watch accessory where you might have 30 companies that are big but not the biggest in the world like Samsung and Apple and are they very easy to get a hold of um, so your question now I your question was about PPAs but I was talking about just the fact that you're working on a smart watch at all is a little nutty um, because you're asking a lot now you're asking about the PPA. So let's say your your modification of a smartwatch was fairly simple and straightforward. What you would do is protect that piece. But you were asking, if I don't understand the mechanical contents of it, how do I get a PPA? And if your product and what you want to do is dependent on understanding the mechanical contents, and that's not your thing, you're not an engineer, you shouldn't be working on that project. Now, if your piece or your change, let's say, Let's say it's this dial, you know, on the side of the smartwatch and you wanted to change just a physical mechanism or something, and that is within your realm of understanding, go for it. But still, again, if it's just for Samsung and Apple, it's not a very attractive project. I'd rather see you work on a smartwatch accessory where you could have 50 companies you could reach out to. So if you don't have a technical understanding of a very complex project and your piece of it requires a technical understanding of that, you should probably move on to the next idea. Okay, so that that's uh, that was uh, Princeton. Thank you, great question. Um, I'm new to this, so sorry if I haven't been thanking you guys for your questions, because they're amazing. Um, Sarah said, would you always recommend getting a PPA? I think I answered that earlier. Absolutely, Sarah. I would always recommend getting a PPA. Um, uh, Let's see what else we got here. Ishmael, I'm just reading these before I even uh, before I even finish reading them. I'm just going to read them out loud. Um, how would you no? Okay, this one's from Neil. How would you go about salvaging relationships established with manufacturers pre-coronavirus who may be apprehensive? after the forecasted economic downturn, how would you license in this reception? Well, you know, at InventRight, we're really not seeing the effect yet. I'm not saying we won't, but our every spring, our negotiation coach is very busy and Paul is very busy right now. And all those deals are still in play. Um, are maybe some of them going to be put off for a little bit? Yeah, I could see that happening. For us at InventRight, we don't see that happening. The other thing, which, you know, I'm just going to address the elephant in the room because other people have questions in this. So I'm going to address some of these uh, coronavirus stuff things, things, stuff things. That's good English, right? Um, I'm going to address some of these coronavirus issues, and then we're just going to get back to licensing and selling inventions. Um, we're finding a lot of these marketing managers, you know, you know, maybe you repair cars for a living. You're not doing that from home right now, right? But if you're a marketing manager for a big company, you're still doing that work from home. And your boss is emailing you. Maybe you're on LinkedIn looking like, hey, maybe I'm, I'm not going to have my job at some point here. Um, we're finding uh, marketing managers to be very responsive because uh, they're looking for that email from their boss to see if they're working because working from home is new for them. So we're finding that companies are uh, being actually a little bit more responsive than normal. Not companies, the marketing managers you're reaching out to. Some people are having a hard, getting, hard time getting hold of people on the phone, but I talked to our head coach today, and he was saying that's not the case. We're hearing back from our students that are the coaches that are talking to our students. Um, 
So I, I think that, you know, it's, it's basically you can, companies are still open to ideas. Deals aren't falling out at this point. Um, and we're, you're able to get into companies. Good companies do very well um, coming out of any sort of issue, whether it's the 2008 financial crisis or this. They are looking to innovate when things are tough. Smart companies are. So when you license to a company during this time, they're more than likely a smart company because they always need new products. People will always need new products. And, you know, these days, before coronavirus, we always talk about the, these days with the way the, the world works for products, the American public has an insatiable appetite for new, 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 new products constantly. The turnover of these products is incredible. That's not going to stop because of the coronavirus. These companies will all need new products. They'll all still need to be competitive with other products. People will still buy products. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, companies, these deals are still in play. You can reach companies. And, you know, a little plug for Ben. Benjamin did our smart pitch program for reaching out to companies on LinkedIn. I and people are getting a response rate of 35 to 65 percent on LinkedIn with our smart pitch program. Now, he's going to do a free webinar to our fans and our audience on Thursday. So we'll, we'll make sure to put a link in the chat. I think the chat just keeps moving up. So we'll make sure to put it at the very end as well. And he's going to do a full one hour webinar on Smart Pitch and, and how to use LinkedIn for licensing now, which is a better time than ever. So I know it's an odd thing to say, but in some ways, this has helped a bit for as far as getting a hold of people. I'm not saying everything is rosy and perfect, but I, and I think that now is a better time than ever to, to work on your projects, especially if you have some time. So in so many ways, I think it's a great time. So let's get back to um, these licensing questions. Uh, let's see. Oh, there's a great one here. Uh, Tommy says, for licensing, do we need copyrights and trademarks before meeting with a company? Um, most of our students, Tommy, they'll file a provisional patent application for $70. Um, sometimes copyrights make sense. Trademarks, there's two types of trademarks. There's what's called a common law trademark, which is the TM. And then there's a registered trademark, which is the R. Okay, The registered trademark you need to pay for. The common law trademark, putting the TM... So let's say you came up with a clever product name and you put TM next to it with those tiny little letters. That's all you need to do. It doesn't cost you a penny. The registered trademark offers you a little bit more protection, but there's a very good chance that they're not going to like your product name. So running out and spending a bunch of money when you're looking to license a product to a company, in most cases, is not smart spending all that money on a trademark. Put the little TM, it puts them on notice that you intend on using that mark. Technically, over a period of time, if you're not using a mark in commerce, this includes a registered trademark too. You can't claim that registered trademark that you pay for and not use it in commerce and not sell the product. So it's not like a provisional patent or a patent. You cannot do it and it still protects you with a patent, but uh, a trademark, that's not the case. So the advice that we give our students is do the common law trademark, the TM, and this isn't legal advice, so seek advice from... Uh, an attorney, if you want legal advice, this is just what I'm telling you. We tell most of our students when we know about their scenario. And it puts them on notice. You intend on using the mark. In 20 years, we've had students in over 65 countries. We've never had that bite an inventor in the butt. It could, but it never has. So that's a, a really good cost-saving measure that you can take. Put the TM instead of the R. You got to pay for the R. You got to file it with the patent office. Um, as far as copyrights go, um, it really depends on what the what the product is. You can file copyrights in some scenarios, and that makes sense. Um, but most of you are going to be filing a provisional patent application. Okay. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, the person's name is Flip Society. They're going by a handle. The sleeping dinosaur ideas. Can small improvements really get around everything that has already been protected? It's not about protection in that case. I love that question. I feel weird calling you Flip Society because that's your handle, but I'll call you Flip. How about that? <laughs> Flip, I love that question. What's more important is it's what companies love. 
Now, whenever I make, I'm going to make this statement and a bunch of you are going to go, oh, but my idea really is very, very new. It doesn't mean you can't license that product. So let's say you got a new barbecue spatula, okay? And it there's eight barbecue spatulas that are somewhat, God forbid, somewhat similar to your idea. And you've got a slight tweak. You got a little notch in it that helps you clean the grate a little bit easier, okay? That's a good thing because companies that are, not all companies are risk adverse, but most companies are somewhat risk adverse, justifiably so. They know the market. They're in barbecue accessories. They, they go, oh, well, you know, what you're doing there, I know there's like eight companies selling something like that be, and it's selling well because if eight companies are selling something like that, it's obviously selling well, right? So, and now you got a slight tweak. So they're like, great, low risk. A percentage of people are going to buy this product over those others because it's got that slight tweak, that slight improvement. So licensing products with slight improvements, you'd be amazed at how slight they can be. It's amazing. It, it reduces their risk. Oh, there's all those things. And then you got a slight improvement. Now, when I say that, some people are like, well, but my product is just so new. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it, which by the way, never, ever, ever in a million years say basically to anybody because it shows you're a green inventor. Even if it's you believe it's true, don't say it, okay? But can you license really mind-blowing new ideas? Yes, but the company's going to look at it and go, well, there's really nothing like it, so I don't know. Or they look at it, but you only need one. Contact 25 companies. One's like, this is really cool. We want this. And other ones are going to be like, you know, it's too new. I just too unknown. I'm not sure. And they'll say, well, really, really cool, but not right for us, not at this time. They'll give you some generic answers, which – I'm going to get back to the virus thing just for a second. You know, companies will give you nonspecific no's, and most of what you're going to get is no's. And you just need one or two maybes. You move forward with a maybe and turn it into a yes. Um, people, companies will typically give answers like, oh, really nice, but not for us, not at this time. We're busy with other projects. And what I see with this virus thing is these are just generic answers. The marketing manager, they're busy. they got a lot of things going on. They just need to move on. And they're polite enough to reply to you. But what they say isn't necessarily what is the case. And, and so they just got to move on. You know, they don't have time to go back and forth with you on email 30 times. And that's fine. You got 25 companies. Some people don't want to talk and discuss it with you. What's going to happen is some of these marketing managers are going to use, instead of that generic response, another generic response that they think people will readily accept. Oh, with the virus, we're really busy right now. And there's going to be people think like, oh, well, then there are no people aren't open when because you haven't reached out to companies, you don't know what normal is and your hit ratio is just the same. They're just giving you different generic answers. And with some of those companies, it's legit. You know, we're focusing on this area. We're not focusing on this type of product because we're refocusing our business. And other people, they're just going to something they say. So for those of you that are reaching out when they give the answer with it's the virus, if you haven't ever reached out to 30 companies before for another product, realize it could be a generic answer. It could be a solid answer. You'll never know, but you only need one company to say yes, and that's always going to be the case, and it's still the case today, okay? Um, let's see, so many questions. Hopefully, I'm not talking too fast, guys. Um, uh, da, da, da. See, I'm going to pull these up on this other screen so I'm not looking sideways at you. So thank Flip, thank you, Flip. Uh, small improvements are great. Big improvements work too. Um, Robin says, do you personally call these companies yourself? Yes, you need to reach out to these companies. And the two major ways you reach out to companies is, well, three, but you reach, you just call them. And the other one is you LinkedIn message them. But you need to know how to handle those calls, right? And and you need to know who to ask for. So we don't have time to go into all the de details, but for the most part, you're reaching out to the marketing manager that handles your XYZ product line. You know, you've observed, you've gone on their website. Most inventors don't do this, so do this. Go on their website, look at their product line, and when you call them and you get a gatekeeper, say, well, you know, and Quite often, they're confused about where to send you. I have a product that I'm looking to license. Uh, is your company open to receiving ideas from the outside? And they're like, mm, I don't know what to do. 
in, it's kind of good if they don't know what to do sometimes. Well, I don't know what to do. And then you say, well, what about your marketing manager for your line, your XYZ line, refer to it by name, because then they know who to direct you to for, for this line. Oh, yeah, that's Bob. I'll put you through because they're just trying to get you off the phone. And when you and Benjamin will talk about this on the free webinar we're doing on Thursday. We'll put that link in the chat at the end of the meeting tonight. Um, when when you're reaching out on LinkedIn, the big tip that Benjamin's going to give you guys is, you know, you never, ever send them your invention unsolicited. Not cool. So when you reach out to them, you're you're. You might think, oh, this is the marketing manager for this product line. I know this is the right guy, but you're not going to assume that. You're going to ask them who would be the right person and give them the opportunity. Who would they be? Are your company open to outside product submissions and who would be the right person? And then you give them the opportunity to say, oh, that would be me or pass the buck to somebody else, but at least they can pass you on over to somebody else. So, but these blindly emailing your sell sheet and your video without getting permission first, that's spam. And the other tip that Benjamin is going to give you on Thursday, if you're able to attend that, is you add people to your network first and then you wait like four or five days. You don't add them to your network and instantly send them stuff. Then it just it doesn't feel as natural. But Ben will give you a ton of tips on that. Um, let's see what else we got here. And you guys definitely have enough questions. I'm going to go with this one because uh, this is a question we get often. Uh, Carly says, advice on attending the licensing expo as an exhibitor versus attendee. If I go as an attendee, my product is too big to carry around and show my prototype. Is my sell sheet enough to gain uh, their buy-in? So Carly, I don't know if you know this, but the licensing expo is not right for 99% of you. So you're like, but Andrew, it has the word licensing in the title. The, and the best way I can explain it, and every year we try to help people out with this, and obviously any expos are on hold for a bit here, but you know all the trade shows are going to come back, guys, so we can still give advice on trade shows. Um, the licensing expo is a brand licensing expo. People trip out on this. So Disney can go there with um, Sophie, Princess Sophia and Cars and Mickey Mouse, and another brand can go there with their brand. So they got like a booth, right? And so the people that go to the licensing expo are people that are manufacturing and selling products. Some of the companies you'd license to, but they're going to walk the show and they're going to meet with these brands, these big giant brands, and they're going to try to get like Jeep, for example, they do a lot of brand licensing. So let's say you're making t-shirts or you're making um, boom boxes. I think I've seen boom boxes, the Jeep brand on there. And you're like, and you talk to the Jeep people. And you say, hey, we make boom boxes. We that's boy, I'm dating myself there, but we make, you know, what Bluetooth uh, speakers. And we want to put the Jeep brand on there, kind of make it look like the Jeep look. And you're gonna talk to Jeep if you're manufacturing your own product, not licensing, because Jeep only wants to talk to people that are manufacturing product and have product already on store shelves. So that's what the it's a brand licensing expo. It's not right for 99.5% of you. So booth, no booth. It's not going to make sense for you to go to that show, Carly, for the most part, okay? And every year we put something in our newsletter explaining that because people get confused on that all the time. Um, got really excited about that one, didn't I? Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, okay. So Ishmael, if a company wanted to license my idea, but I can't afford an attorney to look over it, and I'm not qualified as one to understand all the legal terms fully, what should I do? Should I be worried? So what I can tell you, you know, when our invent right students, we put our students, we have a specialist, Paul Sorensen, he's our negotiation coach. We put them on with Paul. Um, and so I'm going to explain the negotiation process a bit. I think you guys will really find this useful. There's two stages of a licensing negotiation. There's initial interest to contract, and then there's contract to close. The initial interest to contract, way more important than the contract to close. You don't talk to a company and then a week or two later, you got a contract. Now, the only exception to that is the DRTV infomercial guys. They usually have a standard contract. They're very stubborn about changing it. And those deals can happen fast. But pretty much every other deal doesn't happen that fast. The average time, because uh, I asked Paul, the average time from initial interest to a signed contract, the average is three months. So it's like a phone call, five or six emails, 
a phone call, four or five emails. Oh, we need to get some quotes over here. We need to talk to this person, that person, the company. These are big companies, guys. They don't act that quickly. They need time to think about things. And for a lot of products, they're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in taking that sort of risk. Not you, they are. So that takes a bit of time. There's a lot of you interviewing the company about what they're going to do with the product. So they might be this huge company. And if you don't, and I've talked to inventors, not our students, but I've talked to inventors done this. They've just signed whatever the company sent. So Ishmael, don't do this. And they didn't interview the company about specifically what they're going to do with the product and hold them to it in the contract. And now the company's sitting on their product. That has never, ever happened to an event rights student. But it's very dangerous to get into a contract, not understand the contract, and not interview the company. So you want to interview the company about what they can do. So let's say they're this really big company. they got great distribution, Walmart here, there. But then you talk to them. They're like, oh, no, we just want to test it. Just put it on this one online little site. You know, And that's going to be a real big factor if you want to do a deal with them and also going to determine how you structure the contract. The other thing that I can say is licensing contracts are weird, guys. Now, they aren't weird standard ones, but a lot of these companies will send you uh, a contract that their general counsel did, and they don't know what the hell they're doing, which is fine. You're probably like, oh, that's terrible. I'm like, no. And, and our negotiation coach will get on with the student. They'll go through it, go, here's, here's five things that are an issue. Um, here's like three things that are missing. This is a really weird contract, but as long as it has these key things, we're good. So, you know, we, we work with very weird contracts and even licensing attorneys like to do them very differently. It's all about getting the deal done and making sure you're protected in the contract and they're happy and you're happy and it's a, it's an equal thing. Um, so there's a lot of interviewing done as to what they're going to do with it, you know, and this this shocks people. So Ismail's worried about the contract. I'm more worried about you moving the deal forward. Eighty percent of the deals our students get into, if they didn't know based on us guiding them how to move it forward, they wouldn't get that deal done. You're like, but Andrew, they're a big company. They're going to guide me through their process. No. Most licensing, most companies do not have a formal process for licensing. Now you're talking to Bob. Company's done three licensing deals, but Bob's with the company a year and a half. He's never done one. He's your superman because he's the one that showed interest in your product. You need to subtly guide him. Now you're not being pushy, but you're asking certain questions at certain times to move it forward. You're not trying to get it all done on one call. Like I said, it's a call, four or five emails, another call, three or four emails over a period of time. And it's better that way. You're not going to fly out and dance on the corporate boardroom table and do this deal. You're going to do it over time. And it's it's a, it's a very uh, strategic. We guide our students to do very strategic um, to, to move the company. And you're probably like, I can't tell this company what to do, Andrew. You can subtly guide them. They won't feel like you're pushy and they'll appreciate it because a lot of times they don't know how to move it forward. Now, I could see an inventor that um, the company's super interested and the inventor is doing everything wrong to move the deal forward, which you as the inventor need to move it forward more than them in most instances and guide them. Um, and I could see a deal still getting done that way. But I think a lot of licensing deals that from people that aren't our students, they, they fall through, you know. And so the other the other big thing that I'll say is on that first call, it's more about them realizing you're a real person and them realizing you're not a wacky inventor. You're easy enough to work with. So it's about establishing, you know, Jack just wrote in. Yeah, it's about relationships. It's about establishing that relationship. A lot of you, what you'll tend and want to do is you'll want to just do it a bunch via email. That's a giant mistake. One of the first things you do when you get interested is you get on the phone and you talk to them. It's a litmus test as to how I and of course you just say can we just talk for a few minutes i have some questions for you i'm sure you have some for me and you we know it's not going to be a few minutes we know it's going to be 5 10 maybe 15 20 minutes if they're open but that's what you say you want to get on the phone and talk with them and a big a big part of it is they're going to be showing your stuff around the companies they want to make sure you're not going to be doing whacked out stuff and embarrass them so when you're easy to talk to on that first call it doesn't mean later in negotiation you're going to debate things, but you want to be very approachable on that call. And um, 
and answer their questions about the product, you know, and talk about the product and talk about their company. Make statements about a few things that you, oh, well, I, I think it might fit in with this product, like that product. Let them know that you care about them and their company because, you know, they were intrigued with your product. Yes, but just saying a few things about their company is going to impress them because most inventors don't. Um, so uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, oh, okay. This one from Fact Factum. That's a cool name. Um, should I... Should I prototype prior to reaching out to a company? So there is no one answer for that. Um, one thing that Steve and I have been guiding people with mindset stuff on for 20 years is you're not selling your patent and you're not selling your prototype. You're selling the benefit of your idea. So if it makes it easier to clean your car or chop carrots or whatever, that's what you're truly selling. So, and you can sell benefits with a sell sheet or a video. It really has nothing to do with the prototype, okay? Now, you need to be able to relay those benefits. It might be on a sell sheet with a virtual prototype where, um, you know, it's, it's a renderings done, has no, this is what we do for a lot of our students. It has no engineering dimensions, anything, but it looks pretty. So they see it and go, oh, that's what it is. Maybe there's a close-up showing the hinge. You know, oh, okay, I get it. And that could be all done virtually because a lot of products, you can look at them and, and go, and the company's like, well, how do we make this? And you're like, well, there's this product, and there's this product, and I just took basically this product that sells for $9.95, and they're like, oh, and just put a hinge on it here to accomplish that functionality. And they're like, oh, yeah, we can do that. So why did you go out and spend five grand on a prototype when you could have just said that to them after you intrigued them. So what I'm getting to here is you can go fishing and intrigue them and they won't go, oh, you don't have a beautiful working production prototype. Oh, forget you and hang up on you. Never happened in 20 years. Um, doesn't mean they won't ask for it, but if you can address it with a simple conversation and go, well, there's these products and these other products not only could they understand by looking at these products, the samples you give them, that it can be made, but they're like, oh, damn, yeah, we could make it under under 20 bucks too. You know, now, I'm not saying that works 100% of the time, but it's okay to get interest. Now, there are some products where you're like, I just have no idea if this would even work. You know, and you can't base it on looking at existing products and go, well, I would just tweak that, and I'm pretty uh, fairly certain 70% that would work. And you'll need to make some sort of prototype. Maybe it's a... Let's use a simple example. It's some dog toy. And you cannibalize an existing dog toy and you duct tape it and you throw it. And the dog goes crazy for it. But after a few uses, the dog eats it up and it doesn't work right anymore. And you can, you can use those as well for like a video. So maybe let's say it's a dog toy and you throw it and you see the dog going crazy for it in a certain way. Mission accomplished. Benefit accomplished. Get the benefit. You know, and then maybe in the video, you show, you don't show the close up of the duct tape version, but you show a virtual prototype because the video getting to off a, on a, another side note is not necessarily all video. It could be still images with the narration or something like that. So video sell sheets and sell sheets are both legitimate ways to sell. And you're always selling the benefit of your product, not your prototype. So I can't, who's, who's asked that? Factum. I can't answer your question for 100% of cases because sometimes people, you know, you guys have been watching a lot of you, our YouTube show for a long time. We say something and then I hear people, oh, they repeat it. And I'm like, well, okay, yeah, that's right most of the time, but we're not saying everything is black and white. As we talk about an event, right, there's shades of gray too. So there isn't one answer that is always right all the time for all products and all scenarios, you know, but you'd be amazed at how often our students sell the benefit. Most of them have no prototype whatsoever or no working prototype. But I can't say that in your particular case, it wouldn't make sense for you to play around with it, see if it works. Or in some cases, you might need to invest in a prototype. But the vast majority of the time, you can sell the benefits, get the interest, and then they might occasional company, well, you know, unless we get a prototype, but at least you got a fish on the hook to spend five, 10 grand on a prototype when you didn't know if anybody was interested in the benefit, not too smart. It's not, it's almost kind of stupid. Um, but your perception, I understand why you're thinking it. Oh, but the company expects it. 
and they'll just kick me the curb very quickly. Well, if you tell them, well, you were really intrigued and I realize you don't, and a lot of times you get them to work on it. You guys don't want to do this. But um, if I work on it and I show you something, will you, will you take a look? at? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, um, but you're so, it's also another reason to not call and LinkedIn message companies. It's another, yet another reason why you can't get started and get into the world. Because when you can really call yourself an inventor is when you make that first call or that first LinkedIn message to put it in front of a company so they can see it. That's when you're really an inventor. So it's another excuse for some people. Now, for other people, it's not an excuse. You're like, well, I thought I needed that, Andrew. So thank you for telling me I don't. But it's 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 not going to bite you in the butt. It really isn't. And then let's say you get interest from three companies. They're like, wow, this is really cool. But uh, we have hesitations about this or that. And you can maybe address those hesitations without making a prototype. Oh, because they're not creative. You know, a lot of corporations aren't creative. You come up with a solution to that problem and they're like, oh great. And you didn't require you to make a $5,000 prototype or even a $500 prototype. Other times you're like, oh huh, yeah, I don't know how I'm gonna solve that problem, you know, and, and you need to work on it. But maybe they can work with you a little bit and well, tell me this, tell me that, you know. Um, let's see. Um, so Summus, Summus. Um, how do I do a thorough patent search when searching? I find it's hard to find something close to my idea. So uh, first off, don't do a patent search first off ever. Um, we're working on a patent searching program, actually. It's going to be really cool with a former patent examiner who is a professional patent search. It's going to be amazing. But one of the things in the program is always going to say, start with a market search. Okay. So what's a market search? My favorite way of doing a market search is uh, Google Images and Amazon. Those are my two favorites. Google Shopping as well. So why am I saying that? Because a market search tells you way more than a patent search ever could. So I'm not saying don't do a patent search, guys. I'm not saying. So do a market search first. A market search tells you what is or isn't in the marketplace, which is way more telling because those products wouldn't be there if they weren't selling. Those products kind of in the same space. And they would go hit the market and the company would stop selling them very quickly when they don't sell. So it's verifying that people like products in that space when you find similar products. Um, a patent search, the only thing it verifies is some inventor blew a bunch of money with a patent attorney. Because the average inventor thinks the first thing I do is get a patent, right? Because your friends and family, and don't, it's very flattering when your friends and family see your idea or you tell them about your idea, and they say, you better get a patent on that. It's their uneducated point of view. And what they really mean is that's a good idea. You better protect it. Somebody's going to rip you off. So be flattered. But it's terrible advice. So what they really should do, which no way you'll say this, do a market search. See what else is out there. See what product, you see how it fits in. And when you do a market search on Google Images and Google Shopping and Amazon, it's not to prove nothing like it exists. Like I said earlier, if you find things somewhat similar, that's a good thing. Now, then people don't find anything similar. They're like, oh, does that mean my product's not good? No, it doesn't. But you need to be aware of products in that space. Um, so who is it that asked that question? Summus. Um, so Summus, there might be a reason why you're not finding similar patents. Maybe there's no market for this thing. But do a market search. But then you can do a patent search. And, you know, people will quite often when they do a patent search freak out about seeing a similar image. And I'm not, I can't get it deep into patent searching, guys, because that's like a couple hours training. Um, but don't freak out if you see a similar picture. Go to the claims. Now, claims are very confusing. Hopefully, it's only two or three sentences. And this is my weird advice, which is good advice. Read it like you have obsessive compulsive disorder. So it's like three sentences. You read it once. You're like, I don't know what they're talking about because it's like some foreign language, the way they write patents, right? Read it again, again, again. And then you're like, oh, they're just protecting that little hook there. Well, that doesn't affect me at all. Okay, next claim, next claim. And you go through them all. And you're like, oh, I, th I was really concerned based on the picture, but really I'm realizing these claims are really weak. They're on very specific things. That doesn't affect my product. So that's that's my one bit of advice some of us so first do a market search 
and then read through the claims thoroughly. Um, I don't, I can't get into the whole everything about patent searching. That's too much. Um, but uh, let's see. Okay. Oh, I love this one. Okay. So AJ, when you when you sign a licensing deal, do you receive money up front plus royalties or just royalties? Um, what we found, and a big part of our approach in the vast majority of deals, is asking for a bunch bunch of upfront money. In our experience, is one of the biggest rookie moves you could absolutely make, and is a massive deal killer. Now, I'll talk about some exceptions, but I'm going to talk about more of the general rule. Um, these companies are investing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, in your invention, and they're taking all the risk. You're taking no risk. It's their money. It's their workforce. It's their existing distribution. They're in 30,000 stores. Hopefully, they're going to try to get your product 30,000 stores. They're doing a lot for you. For you to ask for 50K up front, give me a quarter million up front, you might as well shoot yourself in the head right now. Stupid, 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 okay? Now I'm gonna tell you when it would make sense. Um, so you wanna backload the deal, not front load the deal, and you'll make way more money that way. The one type of front loading that's okay in most cases is, let's say you file a provisional, you spent 70 bucks, this is a big part of our approach, $70 to file a provisional. They show interest, get them to give you the money, to give your attorney, to then file the full non-provisional and reference the provisional. That's smart. That's a big part of the event right approach. So now you're risking $70 on a provisional, not 8,000 or 10,000 on a patent that you don't even know you have any interest in yet. That's nutty. So the one type of upfront money, and again, this doesn't apply to all companies either. Some companies could care less about patents. I got one um, company tell one of my students, they, they had way deep in negotiations. It never came up. And the student said to the company, uh, so do you want to file patents on this? And this is an extreme case in the way they said it, but I love it. And they said, oh, no, we don't do patents. We'll just crush. They were the biggest guy on the block. We'll just crush the competition with our distribution. And now the student didn't freak out because he's heard us spiel on this. And he's like, I love it. You know, where the average inventor would be freaking out, going, I don't want to protect my idea and blah, blah, blah. But what they were saying is distribution is a better form of protection than any patent could ever be, being the biggest guy on the block or one of the biggest guys on the block. So they didn't care. And they said, you can file it if you want. We don't care. We'll pay you royalties regardless, which is shock, probably shocking a lot of you as well. And that happens more often than you can imagine. So companies range in the spectrum as far as paying for patents. Yes, it's very important. We want to make sure you get all the right claims, okay? That's in the minority. Um, yeah, patents, and then you get people that are kind of in the middle. Yeah, we want the window dressing. We want to be able to say patented. And then companies, we don't care. We just don't care. We'll pay you regardless. So, you know, quite often you can get them to pay for it. Sometimes they won't, but you have to pay for it. But you could, in a roundabout way, ask for a little bit of upfront money, and you just give that to the attorney. And essentially, they are paying for it. So we've seen a lot of deals like that. Um, so asking for them to pay for the patent is a reasonable thing to discuss, and that's upfront money. But you know, if you have an independent practitioner, that could be very reasonable. And it's very, and this is detailed tip, guys, but it's a good tip. Um, some of these companies are thinking 20k for a patent, but you're like, I've got this very competent independent practitioner. And it's going to be about 8K. And they're like, oh, you know, that sounds nice. You know, and so you got to be very careful about talking about it without talking about the price tag on it from the patent attorney you talk to. Because sometimes corporations, they spend way too much money on patents. Um, and they might be very down with that. Now, another thing you can do, it could be an advance on royalties. So they're giving you the money to give to your patent attorney. Let's say it's 8K. But they keep the first 8,000 in royalties. So it's advance on royalties. They can't take it back but they're gonna keep the first AK and the patent is in your name. It's always yours. You always want the patent to be in your name. You don't wanna sign it to them. Your licensing contract gives you the right to take it back, not the patent. So the patent always should be in your name, but the licensing contract is letting them rent the idea. So getting to the other part of the question was, um, what was the other part there? Oh, AJ, when you sign a license deal, do you receive money up front plus royalties or just royalties? You get paid your royalties quarterly. Quarterly meaning every three months. And so as they make money, you make money. They're very up for that. Makes sense, right? Like we, we don't make money. We're faltering. We're going to hand it back to you. We're making great money. We're going to pay you royalty in every single freaking unit that you that we sell, right? Um, now, 
don't think you're going to make that money back overnight. This is not a get rich quick scheme. You can make a lot of money with licensing, but it's not an overnight thing. Okay. So it takes companies six months to nine months, sometimes, sometimes more to put it into production. Then it's got to be in the stores for three months before you get your first royalty check. So it's very common for a lot of products that you're not going to get the first royalty check for a year. Now, when I talk to level-headed inventors, they're like, I'm okay with that, Andrew. This giant company is going to spend all that money, take all the risk, and then I'm going to get paid. And uh, on every unit they sell, and they could sell way more than I ever could. You know, it depends on the products. Is it a 99 cent product? Is it a $600 product? Maybe they can sell half a million units a year. Maybe 10,000 units would be great. It's a $600 product, right? It's all relative. Um, but level-headed inventors see that and they recognize that and realize the incredible power you guys have with the way that at least we teach people to set up licensing contracts. If they don't perform, you get it back. The idea is not theirs. You did not sell it. You rented it or you leased it. So let me see if I answered uh, AJ's question. Yeah, so get the money on the back end, money for the patent, great. Besides that, wouldn't do it. Now, the, getting to the exception, we have students that have are making millions of dollars or making hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're venturing and they're selling their product. And now they want to license it. They're like, I'm drowning. I know a big company could do better than I could. OK, now, if you're giving them tooling, if you're giving them existing distribution, if you're giving them existing inventory, are you going to ask for money up front? Hell, yeah, you are. But that's not the case for most of you, you know. So with all that, it would make sense. But when you're licensing, there was little to no risk on your part. Spend 70 bucks for a provisional, a few bucks for a sell sheet. You know, don't ask for a bunch of money up front. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Um, don't do that. OK. But there's always exceptions. Like I said, shades of gray. I'm going to go the full hour, guys, because I'm having fun. Hopefully you guys are too. Um, so we got eight minutes left. I'll go a full like 10 more minutes or something like that. Uh, let's see what we got here. Um, well, you know, so people worry about this. Tommy wrote, can I mess up a PPA if I do it myself? Can a mistake come back to haunt me? Yes, it could. Now, it doesn't haunt our students because we teach our students to do, we give our students software called Smart AP to file a provisional patent themselves. They do a great job. And our coaches talk to the students about, oh, well, you know, there could be other product variations you need to include. So I'm going to give you some good advice here, Tommy, on the most important thing when you're filing a provisional. It's not about any legal speak because you can put a provisional patent in common English. The really important thing that you need to know, the most important thing when you're filing a provisional is to knock yourself off. Think about all the variations, workarounds, improvements. Inventors, by and large, are very creative people, but there's a point at which a lot of inventors, it becomes fixed in your mind as to what the product is. And that's great. you like, this is what the product is. This is what I'm going to show companies based on all my market research. This is putting my best foot forward with the marketing. But now you need to put that aside. And you need to go, what's the other version that's 80% as good? Don't bother with the version that's 50% as good. That's not competition. That's a waste of your time throwing that in your provisional. Or just as good, but a different way of doing it. Throw all that in the provisional patent. Now, don't. I've seen people get obsessed about it for months doing that. Don't get obsessive about it. But the best advice I can give you on not mucking it up, Sean, sorry, Tommy, um, is to throw all the variations, workarounds, improvements. Reinvent it. Think, go, ah, I'm some sleazy company. I'm going to knock myself off. I'm going to figure out a way around this. I'm going to do it a different way. Throw that in your provisional. You'll be fine. Now, another thing that I can say that is great is you can file the provisional. You can legally say patent pending. You don't have to say provisional patent pending. Show it to all these companies and um, see if there's interest. And the first thing you do is not show them your provisional. If you get a lot of traction, you could then go to an attorney and have them review your, review your provisional before you even show it to the companies and file another one, okay? So they can never see it. They can't see your provisional. They don't know what you're protecting or not protecting, all right? So those are some ways that you can make sure it doesn't haunt you. And with licensing, it shouldn't, shouldn't have to. Again, with anything legal, provisional patents, patents, we are not, uh, we're not attorneys. This is not legal advice. Talk to your legal advisor before taking any action. But these are these are things we train our students on, and we always tell them to do the same. Um, uh, 
Let's see. There's so many. You guys have so many great questions. Oh, here we go. And it's just in the chat here. No one came. Antonio, is there ever a possibility a company will just buy your idea outright? Yeah, it's possible. And again, there's shades of gray, but rookie move to even bring it up. Do not bring it up. Do not. It'll never be as much money as you'd earn with a license. And even the biggest companies don't want to do it. Now, are there some scenario? You have this million dollar, multi-million dollar business. You want to sell them the whole company and license it as, and just sell it outright. Yeah, okay. But if you're licensing, don't bring up, do you want to buy it? God, please don't ever say buy my patent. You're not selling your patent. You're selling the benefit of your product. Never say buy my patent. I know most of that goes, just, well, Andrew, I don't get it. You know, don't say it. It's wrong. And now you're focusing on the intellectual property, which you really should be focusing on the benefit of your product, the product, the product, the product. I think it's the right match for your company. Let's talk about the product. So you don't even talk about the patent stuff until they bring it up. It's something that happens later. Could it happen on first call? Yeah. Do we train our students to handle that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so don't, don't do that by outright. If they insist on it, you go, well, I, I think a, a licensing deal makes sense. So you got to collect all the data to put together what the licensing deal would be, what the royalties would be, what the minimum guarantees would be, all these other things. And if they insist on it, you give them the license deal. Well, I think this makes more sense. And you give them some ludicrous figure with the buyout. But I, I really, without talking to somebody that's an expert at licensing, I would hesitate tremendously to do that at all even. Um, but we sometimes we have companies that are stubborn. It's extremely rare. We're like, yeah, give them the ridiculous figure, give them the licensing figure. But really, you should try to get them just to go the licensing route rather than the buyout route and just say it makes sense. And you have a conversation about it, and which is, you know, another point I'll make is people think they can do this all via email. That's a joke. You have to get on talk with these companies and you're not going to and you don't need to fly out and meet with these companies at all. Um, Licensing is is very virus proof. If you want to get back on that topic, um, we have always told our students you do not need to fly out and meet with these companies, and it will never be right because it doesn't happen in one call. We've had students fight us on that. They did it, and they're like, "Andrew, you're right. Complete waste of time. The right people aren't in the room. We only talked about a few things. So licensing is a call. Emails a call. Emails. So you know you don't need to fly out and meet with them and you." Don't want to try to get it all done in one call. And this is going to scare some of you, but you're more responsible for moving it forward than they are. So keep that in mind. You know, these guys will not go, here's the golden path. Here's our five-step system for licensing. This happens, then this happens. You can ask them if they have a process and they can tell you, but most of them don't. Um, uh, let's see. God, I'm having so much fun, but we can go another five minutes. Let's see if we get some questions over here. I know I talk fast, guys. Sorry about that. But hopefully you're like, hey, I got a lot of info. I don't like it when people talk at a snail's pace personally. But um, who, Linda Marie... Who would you recommend as an initial contact within a company to begin the licensing process? Usually a marketing manager um, for a such and such product line. A marketing manager is usually the key word. Could be assistant to a marketing manager. Um, if you have a hard time getting a hold of those folks, um, the salespeople always pick up their phones. So sales can be great. You can ask them to push it on over to marketing. Um, and they might even say, well, this is great. Like, I'll show this to Bob in marketing. But I would always go for the marketing manager first and the salespeople next. Um, if it's a really small company, you don't want the CEO. You don't. Because what happens is you talk to them. CEOs don't, I'm, again, making a stereotype. The CEOs don't do the work. Other people do it. And if you can find somebody lower in the company, like a marketing manager, they found you. They're going to get rewarded and they're going to work with you. And they tell the CEO, the CEO's like, oh, good. Yeah, keep working on that. The CEO, you talk to the CEO, they shove it down on somebody. Now it's not that really that person's project. It was just kind of shoved upon them. And now they're not going to be that Superman or Superwoman that found this great idea and it blew up their sales. You know, now at small companies, sometimes it is the CEO, but everybody wants to go for the CEO and that's, they won't have the patience with you. They won't have, they won't do the work with you. Um, really avoid the CEO like the plague um, in most of the instances. Um, 
And if you do get them and get somebody, again, there's shades of gray, guys. It's not all black and white. And then you say, oh, great, great. I, I like this product. Is there somebody that I should be working with to move this thing forward? That's fine. Um, but but really try to go after the marketing managers first and the salespeople first. So I just feel like, well, you guys want to do this for 24 hours? Um, <laughs> we, could, we could do, we should do a marathon. Um, Madeline, um, thank you very much. She's, I'm not doing that typing, by the way, the typing that says invent right TV, that's Madeline. So thank you so much for that. Cause I could not talk like this and still read all this stuff and, and type. Um, let's see. Uh, so why don't you, if you have any, um, if you have anything you want to say, uh, Linda Marie said, thank you. Um, uh, it, you know, uh, another person said, is it being recorded? I, 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 it's our first time doing a live broadcast. Madeline, I believe that automatically it gets recorded and then we can make this stream available. Looks like I've got, I've got an hour and 49 seconds so far. Um, yeah. Let's see. Oh, well, I'm going to lie to the last one. Hostile, what is the fastest way for me to license a product that only sketches exist without it actually being brought to market? Um, you need to do more. You need to create a marketing piece, Hostile, um, that shows the benefit of your product. It's like an advertisement for your product. You can't send your rough sketches and then do a rambling email. And I wouldn't say anything about licensing is quick. Um, don't get it. If you guys want to do this with one idea, if you, I always tell people interested in our program, if you got one idea and you never want to do this again, I tell people don't sign up with our coaching program because you, what you're going to do with that first product, whether you're on your own or you're with us, is you're going to learn how to license. And for somebody then not to take that skill and apply it to more ideas defeats the purpose. And most of you have an endless list of ideas, or if you had to think on it, you could definitely come up with more ideas. So I know I'm glomming onto that one piece that you wrote there, Hustile, but uh, it's not quick. There's no quick and easy thing here. It's work. Now, one thing I will say, I think it's a good thing to finish off the, the whole session with. And um, if you guys could stop, type, well, you can type in questions. Madeline, you could put those links in there later. Yeah, yeah, great. You got my email and all that. Madeline, if you could put the link to the um, webinar we're going to do on Thursday, I encourage you to attend that. It's on using LinkedIn for licensing. A lot of great tips. If you felt like I gave a lot of great info, Ben is going to give a lot of great info for free on the LinkedIn for licensing webinar on Thursday. So make sure to get registered for that. But um, licensing is, is a numbers game. It's not a get rich quick scheme. So you have to be dedicated to doing the work. Now, Fortunately, it's literally one thousandth the work of running a business, but you still need to do the work to file your PPA, to make a sell sheet, to research your list of companies and to reach out to companies. And, you know, some companies you'll need to reach out to eight, nine times. Other ones, first time. Oh, yeah. Talk to the gatekeeper. Oh, that's Bob. Or you reach out on LinkedIn. And they're like, oh, no, I'm the right person. Oh, I'll direct you the right person. So you need to learn to be persistent. I don't think it is. It's sales. But it is, you need the persistence of a salesperson. So you don't need to run a business. You don't need to raise money. You don't need, you don't need any of that. You just need to do, to approach, you know, for most ideas, 12 to 30 companies, and you only need one to be interested. So you need to get used to the fact that you might approach 30 companies, 28 aren't interested, two are, one falls off and you do a deal with one. Or you do a deal with none, you move on to the next product. You need to get used to that. That is what we, we break inventors in like a wild stallion. I've never done this before. I've never said this before. But inventors, are, you guys are like wild stallions with ideas and we need to break you so that you can be successful with the business aspect of licensing. And it's a very positive thing. And you can be that incredible racehorse that goes through life being able to license your products. But understanding that you're going to get a ton of no's, but that you don't need to blow a bunch of money on patents or prototypes or 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 any of this stuff and you don't need to start a business it's extremely empowering at the same time i'm not going to make it sound like you don't need to make any effort because you do but it's a thousandth the effort of running a business but you need to ma make the effort to reach out to 30 companies so we're all about keeping it real and if, if people don't sign up with our program because i say that good i don't want them because you're not ready yet now some people listen to that for a while they're like yeah i'm i'm ready to do the work whether it's on your own 
reading our books, watching our videos, or whatever it is you're doing, um, you know, realize it's not going to be a piece of cake. But the information we provide, oh my God, it makes it so much easier because inventors typically with licensing will go completely down the wrong path. But if you got some good information, and again, attend the, the LinkedIn for licensing webinar on Thursday. You know, we want to support the community. That's why I'm doing this, the inventor community. Um, and I really look forward to doing another live session at some point. It's the first time we've done it. Um, you guys want to type in if you liked it? Type into the chat if you guys liked it. Um, see what I read. Cool. So, all right. So, anyway, uh, I can't stop talking because I love sharing this information. Um, I want to remind everybody to keep, take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you next time. See ya. Good night. Bye.